It's always a challenge for me to know what to uh, preach on at this conference. Um, I often say that sermons for me are kind of a blur every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, month after month, year after year after year, and uh, it isn't necessarily true that I see one or another rise above the rest, and I I never know when one is uh, more helpful, less helpful, better. profound, uh, plain. I, I really am not the one to make that kind of judgment. Uh, so I'm a bit dependent upon the, the folks around me who say, John, when the Shepherd Conference comes, this is what you need to do. Uh, and they give me some, some good encouragement. And uh, along that line, uh, I'm, I'm responding to them, and it's a passage of Scripture that I, I think will be a wonderful blessing to you, though it's one with which you are already very familiar. I want you to turn to John 3. Here at Grace Church, we're actually going through the Gospel of John again. We, we did this the first year I came back in 1969, and uh, so now we're going through it again, this time with some depth, I might add. <laughs> and we're, we're having an absolutely wonderful time in the Gospel of John. And. Uh, we have recently gone through the third chapter, and I, and I guess why that uh, struck people uh, the way it did in, in a fresh and, and dynamic way, and uh, was suggested it would be helpful to you. Let me see if I can just kind of make a few preliminary comments to set it up. Uh, I, I want you to work with me through this passage. I, I, I want you to look at this passage not as an audience, but as a student. I, I, I want to kind of take you through the process of expositing a passage, of, of drilling down on it and, uh, and understanding its, its richness. At the same time, uh, it isn't just an exercise in uh, hermeneutics or uh, an exercise in exposition. I, I, I want it to give you perhaps a fresh understanding of the work of evangelism, because at the end of the day, the church's responsibility in the world is to fulfill the Great Commission, right? I mean, that's why we are here. And whatever else we do short of that is to prepare us to do that more effectively. Well, whatever goes on in the church by way of pastors and, uh, and teachers and um, evangelists perfecting the saints is so that the saints can do the work of the ministry, build up the body of Christ. Uh, to Christ's likeness and then be able to speak the truth in love that's credible because of transformed lives. So the end of everything is evangelism. And I think there are, there are so many misconceptions about evangelism, and if this is our primary responsibility, then there are some foundational realities that we need to really understand. And this passage then becomes immensely helpful for us. Actually. A couple of days ago on Sunday morning, I addressed the, uh, the, the middle half or the middle section really of this chapter, but the back half of this conversation with Nicodemus. So I'm kind of backing up for those who are here on Sunday to cover the opening ten verses of this very interesting dialogue. I know this is familiar to you, but I want you to listen as I read verses 1 through 12. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? 
Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Very familiar portion of Holy Scripture. As gospel preachers and gospel ministers, we are called to lead the church of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fulfillment of the Great Commission. This is the raison d'etre. This is the reason to be for the church. How we fulfill that priority duty is critical. And there is a foundational reality that must be fully embraced if we are to understand anything about evangelism. And it is given here by none other than our Lord. And in this context, the Lord Jesus, the perfect evangelist, is evangelizing the teacher in Israel. And over the last couple of weeks, I've thought to myself, if I had the opportunity to evangelize the Pope, I would follow the pattern of our Lord right here in John chapter 3. In a sense, Jesus is evangelizing perhaps the most religious man, the ultimate religious leader in Israel, the teacher among the Pharisees who were the religious establishment. If I had the opportunity to sit down with a pope, I would would take him phrase by phrase through this discussion that Jesus had with Nicodemus because here is the foundation to understanding evangelism. And I know this is a most familiar text, and I think its familiarity sometimes locks it up. We think we know it. Familiarity breeds that kind of contempt that sends us to another passage with which we are more familiar. By the way, in what I read, five times there's a statement about being born again. That is a very familiar sort of evangelical pop culture term, born again. All evangelists, at least in my experience and lifetime, call for people to be born again. And inevitably, preachers tell people how to be born again. Twenty-five years ago, a book was produced that has been a staple in the evangelical world. The title of it is, How to Be Born Again. How to Be Born Again. Steps to the New Birth. It is pretty common. I was in an event last night in uh, uh, Nashville, Tennessee. I didn't get in until about 2 o'clock this morning. And uh, there, there was a proclamation about how many uh, millions of people had been told how to be born again, and they had responded with a a prayer of, of profession that they wanted to be born again. Sometimes invitations are given telling people to come forward and be born again. Here is the way to be born again. Pray this prayer and be born again. All of this is in exact opposition to what this passage teaches. All of it. It it completely misrepresents this entire passage. Is it any wonder then that in the church we have so much trouble understanding the heavenly things when we can't even grasp an earthly analogy? That's exactly what Jesus said to Nicodemus. If you don't get this earthly analogy about birth, how can I talk to you about transcendent heavenly things that really have no earthly analogy? This is an earthly thing. This is a simple idea. Let me make it real simple. What contribution did you make to your physical birth? Good class. (laughs) Is that hard? I mean, just that answer tells me that you're a Calvinist. (laughs) End of discussion. You're on record. I heard it. It's recorded. That's the whole point. Simple truth. Here is a phony, self-righteous, legalistic, 
hypocritical Pharisee. And Jesus is having a conversation with him about entry into the kingdom, and the bottom line is He tells him, what you want, you can't do. There are no steps. Jesus doesn't give him any steps to be born again. He doesn't tell him how to give birth to himself. That's ludicrous. This is not a complicated analogy. And if you ever grasp this most fundamental truth of salvation, that something must happen to you that comes from heaven which you do not participate in, you're on your way to understanding the heavenly aspects of the panoply of the glorious elements of the doctrine of salvation. And yet, almost every person who wants to fight against the sovereignty of God in salvation preaches this chapter, misses the whole point of the analogy. This is the foundational truth of salvation. The Lord gives no command. He does not tell him to be born again by doing such and such. He does say you must be born again. That's not a command. That's a statement of fact, okay? You must be born again. That's a statement of fact. That's not a command. That's a fact. There are no steps. Jesus doesn't say, pray this prayer, do this. The very analogy defies that kind of understanding. The whole point of this analogy is that something must happen to you in which you make no contribution, in which you do not participate. What role did you play in your human birth? What role did you play in your physical birth? None. What contribution did you make? None. That's the whole idea. Our Lord chooses His analogies very, very carefully. For somebody to come up with steps to being born again is ludicrous and absurd in view of the analogy that our Lord chooses. He could have chosen any analogy He wanted. He chose, as He always does, the perfect one to communicate that the only way into His kingdom, the only way to possess eternal life, the only way to be forgiven and escape hell and go to heaven is to have God do a work in your life in which you do not participate. This is a divine work from heaven. Born again, anothen, born from above, literally, born from above. We make no contribution to being born. We make no contribution to being born again. It is from above. Birth happens to us, not by us. We receive life and existence from God physically. We receive life and spiritual existence from God as a divine miracle. The message is that regeneration is required to enter the kingdom, and regeneration is by divine sovereign choice, divine sovereign will, and divine sovereign power. It is not produced by being more religious, more moral, more virtuous. It is not produced by trying harder to be good, not at all. It is, as theologians call it, monergistic rather than synergistic. Regeneration is what he's talking about, birth. It's the second work of God in saving His people. The first work of God in saving His people is election in eternity past. The second work of God is regeneration. So we have to start our grasp on the whole work of evangelism fulfilling the Great Commission with an understanding from this simple earthly analogy that the foundation of everything is that Salvation starts and begins by a divine work of God in which people do not participate. Another way to identify this truth, and I'm, I'm kind of telling you the whole story before we get into the text, but I want it to be firm in your mind. Another way to identify this truth is to understand this as the call of God, the divine call. Theologians have called it the uh, the irresistible call, the, the effectual call, the effective call, the efficacious call. 
Essentially, it is the divine subpoena for the dead to come to life. This is regeneration. This is the very work of God uh, which brings the dead sinner to life. And Romans 8, 28 says that whomever God predestines, He calls, and whomever He calls, He justifies, and whoever He justifies, He glorifies. So that is the work of God, election, calling or regeneration, justification, glorification. Uh, those are the elements of salvation. You can't even grasp the, the heavenly realities of election, justification, and glorification unless you understand the earthly analogy of birth, regeneration. Nicodemus comes like any, any Jew, especially one at his level, wanting to know, you know, what he hasn't done or what he's slipped up and done that he shouldn't have done, what, what are the things he needs to stop doing, what are the few steps he needs to do uh, to take him the rest of the way, and Jesus stops him dead in his tracks and says, something has to happen to you in which you contribute absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing. Now with that as kind of a background, let's look at the text and just kind of break it into three parts, the sinner's worry, the Savior's word, and the Spirit's work. The sinner's worry, the Savior's word, and the Spirit's work. Um, there, there's, a, there's a lot going on here, but, but let's just look at the evangelistic aspect of this passage. The kingdom of salvation, listen, the kingdom of salvation opens its doors only from the inside, only from the inside, and only to those who abandon all self-effort as a means of salvation and are granted by God new birth. Now this literally stops this legalist dead in his tracks because it's all he's ever known has been that you earn your way in. Now let's go back to verse 23 of 2 and, and kind of work through this a little bit. When he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, this is at the beginning of his ministry, many believed in his name, uh, or observing his signs, which he was doing. But Jesus on His part was not entrusting Himself to them, for He knew all men, and because He didn't need anyone to testify concerning man, for He Himself knew what was in man. He knew what was in man. He knew the secret thoughts of every single man. He reads every mind. Uh, this is John affirming the deity and glory of the Son of God based on His omniscience. He knows what only God can know and knows. And so Jesus is aware that though they believed in His name, it isn't saving faith. What did they believe? What, what, what was the essential content of what they believed? Go down to verse 2 of chapter 3. We know, and He's speaking for Himself and the others that are mentioned back in 23 to 25, the many who believed in His name, that there probably was a lot of discussion going on among these who may have found each other. And so Nicodemus speaks for all of them. This is what we know. This is what we believe. We know you have come from God as a teacher because no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So this is what they believe. They believe he's a teacher from God. They believe that. They've never seen a miracle worker. There hasn't been a miracle worker. There hasn't been a prophet uh, up until John the Baptist, and John the Baptist didn't do any miracles. There hadn't been a prophet for 400 years. Um, they, they were not used to miracles. Miracles didn't happen. And then they came in a flurry, and Jesus had been doing them uh, before and during and after the Passover on this very uh, occasion. So they were very aware that this had to be a teacher from God. That's essentially what they believed. Now this gives tremendous hope to Nicodemus. Here is a teacher from God, obviously because of the power that is on display through him, power over demons, power over disease. That later he would demonstrate power over death and power over nature, and he began to show that power, and they drew an obvious conclusion. That leads us into the story of one of them, one of these believers, one of these believers who believed in his name to the degree that they believed he was a teacher sent from God. With all of his religion, with all of his um, achievements, and historians tell us that Nicodemus was one of the three wealthiest people in the city of Jerusalem, and he had achieved that wealth uh, because he had been so elevated as, as a teacher. He was a part of the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court of Israel. 
He, he was a highly esteemed man, verse 10, the teacher in Israel, definite article. He had reached the absolute pinnacle in Pharisaic Judaism. He was the chief apostate hypocrite. That's what he was. <laughs> and guess what? Hypocrites know they're hypocrites. It's a game they play. It's a game they play. They're not deceived. They, they know their own wretchedness. And this is a man who is among the Pharisees named Nicodemus. His name means victor over the people from which we get uh, uh, Nike, Nicodemus. He was, he was named a, a kind of a triumphant name. He is a Pharisee, which means he's a legalist. He's at the heart of apostate, corrupt Judaism. In fact, he, had, he and all of his friends had recently been assaulted back in chapter 2, verses 13 to 18. Jesus came to the temple, which was run by the Sadducees, but embodied the religion of the Pharisees. You remember he made a whip and he just attacked it. I wouldn't ever call it cleansing the temple because it was as foul when he finished as it was before he started. So he didn't do anything to clean the place. He cleaned out the place in that sense. So he had literally assaulted the, the religion that Nicodemus uh, was a part of and a very important part of. He is among the most separated. That's, that's what Pharisee means. He, he is among the most devout. He has taken the, the high road. Um, he's an elevated man. But the truth of the man is this. His life was a pile of manure. You say, how do you know that? Because that's exactly what Paul said it was in Philippians chapter 3. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was zealous for the law. He was a tribe of Benjamin, uh, um, you know, blameless, etc., etc., circumcised. And he said it was all what? It's all manure, all dung, excrement. So here was a man whose life was just full of that. That's all it was and nothing more. Now that is the best that can be said about it. <laughs> that is the best that can be said about it. The worst that can be said about it is the diatribe that Jesus pronounced on the Pharisees in the 23rd chapter of Matthew. And you remember that in the 23rd chapter of Matthew, Jesus blistered them. It's the, it's the most blistering maldiction he ever uttered against anybody that's recorded on the pages of the Gospels. And he identified them as hypocrites every way possible, um, as whited tombs inside full of dead men's bones. I, I think the most devastating one, he called them sons of hell who produce more sons of hell. Uh, they, they, they literally are responsible for hellish results in people's lives. They're responsible, in a sense, for catapulting people into hell with their deception and their lies. They're a part of a progeny that have killed the prophets and murdered the prophets and slaughtered the prophets and will now slaughter the Son of God and desolation will come upon Israel and upon Jerusalem and upon the temple. And you remember Matthew 23. It's just an unbelievable statement of rebuke and devastating judgment on the Pharisees. Well, here is their main man. So I don't know how, what your sentimental ideas about Nicodemus have been in the past. This is a bad man. But in the eyes of the people, it's an elevated man. He comes from probably elite family. He's very, very wealthy. He is a very gifted and able teacher. He is probably as good as there is um, an articulator of apostasy. He's very adept. He's at the top of the pile. He's a ruler of the Jews, a rabbi, a teacher, the teacher. By the way, he's the only Pharisee in the entire Gospels who ever came to Jesus. The only one. If you want to get an illustration, you have to go to Paul to find another Pharisee. There's. Uh, there's fear in his heart. So we call this a sinner's worry. He comes to Jesus. He's very cordial, rabbi. It says he came to Jesus by night. People say, what does that mean? It means he came to Jesus by night. <laughs> what, do you, what do you want me to say? You mean you want to put something in the white space? I don't know why he came by night, but you can read pages and pages about why he came by night. Night depicted his sin. He was trying to hide. I don't know. He came by night. 
I, I would suggest that any time is a good time to come to Jesus. Would you agree? Okay. Yeah, so let's not preach on that. You know, I love the response of our Lord. Now remember this. This is, this is, like, this is like the Pope coming to Jesus. This is the main religious man of an apostate, corrupted system. And you don't hear a diatribe like you do in Matthew 23 against him. What you get here is a kind of a fulfillment of Matthew 12:20. Do you remember that? Borrowed from Isaiah 42, which says concerning Christ, a battered reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not put out. Here was a man who was a battered reed. Here was a man who was a smoldering wick. The light of his life was burning low. He was full of fear, dread, doubt, worry, angst. There's a courtesy rabbi. He knew what that word meant because it had been used to speak of him on a daily basis. And he affirms the fact that he knows he's a teacher from God. God has to be with you. And in his mind, he's thinking, maybe I can, maybe I can find the answer here. I've reached the pinnacle of religion. I've come to the very top, and I'm a hypocrite, and I know it. I know it. Where do I go? Where do I turn? Here's a man who's from God. Maybe he knows what else I need to do. And that's why he came. Now, the Pharisees had some things going for them. They believed in the divine decree. They believed in moral accountability. They believed in um, immortality. They believed in bodily resurrection. They believed in angels. They believed in eternal rewards. They believed in punishment. But they also believed that um, it was their conformity to the law and the rituals and the ceremonies and their morality that would get them into God's kingdom. That's what he believed. And of course, he was part of a, of a group of 6,000, as best we can tell, and no more, who uh, had walked the road less traveled. But in his heart, there's deep, profound anxiety and fear, because he knows there is a judgment. He knows he is morally accountable, and he knows he's a fraud as arch-hypocrites always do. Um, that's the sinner's worry. That's Nicodemus' fear. Then you come in verses 3 and following to the Savior's Word. And this is just so clear and so simple. I don't know how it can be missed so frequently. The Lord doesn't really um, pay any attention to the greeting, apparently. And by the way, this is a cryptic account. Nicodemus disappears after verse 10. The Lord continues to talk to him in a monologue all the way down to verse 21, but he doesn't react anymore. You can read the whole thing in 10 minutes, but believe me, he came by night and that conversation went on for hours, and what you're getting is the condensed Cliff Notes version. He feared with all his religion, with all his ritual, with all his external morality, with all his righteous behaviors, he was outside the kingdom of God. He was outside the kingdom of God, and he was absolutely right. And so Jesus ignores the greeting, goes right to the issue. And by the way, how did Jesus know this was the issue? You were just told that in verses 23 to 25 of chapter 2 because he knew it was in the heart of a man, so he just read his mind. And he said to him, Jesus answered and said to him, truly, truly, and by the way, that's used 25 times in the Gospel of John because this is all new information to a legalistic religion. They're hearing the truth in the midst of a, uh, of a lifetime of having heard lies. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He knew what was in his heart. He knew that Nicodemus had profound fear that he was not in the kingdom of God, and he desired to be in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of salvation that would end in eternal life. 
I understand there's a universal kingdom of God in which He rules over His entire creation. There's a mediatorial uh, and spiritual kingdom of God, the realm of salvation in which He rules over all the redeemed. There's coming a millennial earthly kingdom of God when Christ reigns, and then there's the everlasting new heaven and new earth, which is the eternal kingdom. I understand all of that. And I believe that Nicodemus probably understood uh, that in some way, the fullness of that. He would have understood the, God's universal kingdom, but he was really after the, uh, the relationship with God that would place him in, in God's care, under God's love, in God's blessing with the hope of everlasting and eternal life. Spiritual realm in which he would belong to God, come under God's blessing, God's protection, and God's provision and blessing. He had a place in Judaism, very high place, but, but though he knew that, it didn't satisfy his heart. He had Abraham as his father, and that didn't satisfy his heart because he feared he had no place in God's kingdom and he didn't have God as his father. He was no better, listen, he was no better than an immoral pagan. He was no better than an immoral pagan. His religion did no more for him than animism. Jesus says, truly, truly, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That is not an invitation. That is not a command. That is a statement of fact. That is a statement of fact. Religion at its highest, Judaism at its highest, the worship of the, of, of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who is the Creator, religion, even Judaism, is totally and completely and utterly useless. It is ineffective. It counts for nothing, absolutely nothing. Meaningless. Jesus' words shatter, devastate, crush once and for all every supposed excellence of man's religious devotion and moral behavior. It all adds up to zero. Meaningless. It's manure. This is a devastating statement. Take all the religion of the world, and it is no better and no more helpful than if you were Christopher Hitchens and died cursing God as an atheist. He says, you must be born again. It has nothing to do with your religion. And he says it five times, verse 3, 5, 6, 7, 8. And I won't take the time to do that, but you can go through 1 John 2, 3, 4, 5, and you'll see a half a dozen times this concept of being born again, born again, born again, born again, born again. What that means is that everything you've accumulated in your life counts for nothing. None of it can make a contribution at all. You have to go all the way back to the beginning. And this is how Jesus stops the moral, religious person cold, dead. It all meant absolutely nothing, all of it, nothing. This birth is not achieved by man. Do you remember chapter 1, verses 12 and 13? Many has received Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in His name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God." By the way, believing and faith follows regeneration. They believe because they were born of God. Man, whether he's religious or irreligious, whether he's a priest or an atheist, whether he's a pope or a prostitute, is alienated from God, dead in sin, and can offer God nothing that contributes to his salvation, absolutely nothing. All His works are dead works. In fact, the religious man may be worse off 
if he tramples underfoot the blood of the covenant and accounts it an unholy thing and does despite to the Spirit of grace because he's the one who has a sorer punishment. So this is the truth of regeneration. When we evangelize people and somebody comes and says, what do I do to be saved? What's the answer? Pray this prayer? Take these steps? The first answer that Jesus gives to the man is, there's nothing you can do. Nothing you can do. You need to be born from above. Something has to happen to you. This is the truth of regeneration. It's all over the New Testament. It, it is all over the New Testament. First Peter 1, begotten again by the word of truth, Romans 6, Ephesians 2, everywhere. But let me just show you one passage that sets it in clear perspective, James 1, James 1, 17. Don't be deceived. Don't be fooled. Satan would like you to be deceived, obviously, about the matter of regeneration. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above. You have to be born from above. Here's, a, here's that very parallel. This is both inclusive and comprehensive. Every good thing, every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Father of lights was an ancient Jewish title for God as the creator of light, and it's a wonderful one to use here because there are all kinds of shadows and changes in light. Uh, the, as the earth rotates, it, it, part of the time we're in the sun, part of the time the sun is obscured and we have darkness. Uh, that's just all of our human experience. But when it comes to God, there is no variation. He is light all the time. He, uh, he is just defined that way. There, there's no parallax with God. No matter what angle you look at Him, you see the same thing. And then he goes on to say this, in the exercise of His will, He brought us forth. In the exercise of His will, He brought us forth. He gave us birth. He birthed us. He gave us life. Now, you can go back to John chapter 3. So, so this, that's just one of many, many scriptures that talk about regeneration being a sovereign, miraculous work of God. Now we come to the response of Nicodemus in verse 4. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Now that, that, uh, that response from Nicodemus has, uh, has, I think, been misrepresented an awful lot. Nicodemus is a smart man. He didn't get to be the top of the Pharisaic pile. He didn't become the teacher in Israel because he didn't understand analogies. I promise you, he spent his whole rabbinic life talking in analogies. That's what rabbis did. They, they talked off the, the, off the idea onto the illustration. If you read rabbinic literature, it's all about analogies and illustrations and word pictures. This is life for him. He was very used to this. So he got it. He got it. He knows exactly what the conversation is about. He doesn't say to Jesus, whoa, 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 why are you talking about that? He knows he read his mind, and he got the earthly analogy in a sense. So he asks two questions. How can a man be born when he's old? He can't enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? He is simply responding by saying this, what you're suggesting in your analogy is that to enter the kingdom is impossible for me. Right. Right. He gets it. He picks up the analogy. You're suggesting that I can't do anything to enter the kingdom. Right. I mean, do you understand? This just turns his entire life on its head. 
This is Paul on the Damascus Road for the first time realizing it was all manure. He understands the analogy better than many evangelicals, apparently. It's very clear. It's a simple earthly analogy. You're, you're trying to… you're asking about what you can do, and the answer is nothing, absolutely nothing. He's reacting like any legalist would react. He's saying, in effect, well, what, what about my whole life? It doesn't count for anything. Well, what, what about all the morality? What, what about all the rituals? What about all the ceremonies? What about all the sacrifices that I, that I, I offered? What, what about that? What, what about all the people that I helped and all the teaching I did? And what about all the times I told people about the, the Old Testament and, and called them to, to worship God? What, what about all that? What about all the goodness thing, the goodness I did? What about all the alms I gave? What, what about all the help that I gave? Meaningless. Meaningless. This is new. This is new. That's why Jesus said, truly, truly. He's hearing for the first time in his life that God has to do a work in his soul that is a work of creation, sort of like his human birth, to which he makes no contribution. Jesus is shattering everything he has ever known about religion. Verse 5, Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Oh, water and the Spirit. W what does that mean? Well, you've, you've heard lots of explanations of that. Water refers to human birth and Spirit refers to spiritual birth. That's, that's not the, the right way to interpret that. Um, in English, we call… we say the water breaks, but that's, that was not a Hebrew expression. Some people think this means baptism. That's a popular notion. But Nicodemus w would know nothing about Christian baptism, since Christian baptism didn't start till the church started, Pentecost. So he wouldn't have known anything about water as such in, in any kind of baptism though there, was a, there were washings and proselyte baptisms. What is our Lord saying? Our, our Lord is, is just simply referring to the, the New Covenant passages, in particular in Ezekiel 36. Turn to Ezekiel 36 for a moment. This is a teacher in Israel who, who knows his Old Testament, who is a master of the Old Testament text. He would know the wonderful promise of Ezekiel 36. And you, you know it as well. This is a promise from God. And, and here, this is very important to understand this text. We could look at others, but for the sake of time, this one will do. There will come a time in verses 22 and following that God will uh, vindicate His holiness and vindicate His great name. And He will, in verse 24, take um, the scattered people of Israel from the nations and gather them from the lands and bring them into their own land. Okay, then this promise. This is the promise of the future salvation of Israel. Notice, I will, and you will see it here five times. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart, put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you, cause you to walk in my statutes, and finally, you will be careful to observe my ordinances." That's regeneration. That's the heavenly work. I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, and then you will. Nicodemus knew that passage. He knew that Regeneration was a work of God. You find the same emphasis in the 11th chapter of Ezekiel. You find it illustrated in the 37th chapter of Israel in the Valley of Dry Bones, right? Where God gives life to the dead bones. 
You find this in Jeremiah 24. You find it in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 33, the new covenant passage in Jeremiah. So this is not new. Nicodemus, what has to happen is this. Unless one, notice how he's talking third person here. He's not inviting Nicodemus to do anything. He's stating facts. Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, in other words, unless that divine I will work of God happens in which God cleanses the sinner's heart and takes out his stony heart and plants his spirit within and gives him life, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And again, what he's emphasizing is this is a work of God. This is a work that only God can do and does without the aid of the sinner. And verse 5 is from the text of Ezekiel. Verse 6 is just reason. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. The, the flesh can only produce more flesh. That's uh, depravity. That should be well known to Nicodemus. If you read Romans 3, 10 to 20, you know there's none righteous, no, not one. You go all the way down that. You know that every single one of those lines was taken out of the Old Testament, every one. So there's a very clear doctrine of total depravity in the Old Testament. Total depravity of man, utter inability is an Old Testament doctrine. And if you had any questions about the wretchedness of man in the Old Testament, you must have skipped the flood. So this is the foundation of all gospel and salvation truth. The sinner is flesh, and flesh produces only more of itself. I mean, Nicodemus has nowhere to go. All his religion has been crushed into powder. All his morality has been revealed to be useless. He can make no contribution. He is literally there without capability. Nowhere to turn. It, it looks like a dead end. All that the flesh can produce is the flesh. And then this, but that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. That which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born from above. Lazarus can't raise himself, and we are a race of Lazaruses. The Lord never gives the sinner any hope that he can make any contribution to his salvation. No hope. And do you understand? This is the archetypal legalist being told it's all useless. Now, this is so instructive for us when we do evangelism to stop the sinner dead in his tracks in the hopelessness of his own anger, of his own angst and his own fear and his own inability. And so no wonder Jesus in verse 7 repeats it, don't be amazed then. You can only produce flesh. You must be born from above. You must be born from above. You must be born of the Spirit. So we see the sinner's worry in the couple of verses that open the thing, and then we see the Savior's word about this regeneration being a heavenly work, a unilateral, monergistic work of God. And then thirdly, you see this, the work of the Spirit. So the sinner's worry, the Savior's word, and the Spirit's work. This is amazing. Verse 8. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it. Don't, do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. What a statement. Contrary to saying, here's how to be born again, Nicodemus. Here's the steps. Pray this prayer. Say these words. Jesus says to him, you're not in control of this any more than you control the wind. You can't summon the wind. You can't dismiss the wind. The wind blows where it wishes, 
and you can hear it, but you don't know where it comes from. You don't know where it's going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. What a strange statement. What a strange way to do evangelism. And this is Jesus who could have said, you're going to be all right because I know the plan and you're in it. (laughs) But instead, He leaves this massive mystery. You're not in control of it. How about that? The next time an anxious sinner comes to you and you say you must be born from above and this is 100% a work of God by sovereign grace based upon His predetermined uh, love set on you before the world began, this is something He chooses to do and uh, he, He will do it if and when He chooses to do it. You have just placed the sinner in the absolute perfect position because he is now faced with the fact that he can do nothing. It's all the work of the Spirit. The Spirit convicts of sin, righteousness, judgment. The Spirit produces repentance. The Spirit produces faith. And all of that is in the work of the Spirit in which He gives life. Here's another analogy, the analogy of the wind. This is, a, this is another earthly thing. I'm giving you a simple analogy. The wind is invisible. The wind is irresistible. The wind is uncontrollable. The wind is unpredictable. <laughs> The wind is not um, subject to human summons or desire, so is the work of the Holy Spirit. Wow, what a statement. Nicodemus right now has got a theological headache. In verse 9 he says, how can these things be? (laughs) Everything he's ever known is turned upside down, inside out. He isn't even willing to accept the truth of depravity, inability, certainly not birth, regeneration, to which he can make no contribution at all. And I suggest to you that this is just pure spiritual genius, putting the sinner in an impossible position. And Jesus says to him, mm-hmm. are you the teacher of Israel and you don't understand these things? He understood the analogy, but he just doesn't understand that this is the way into the kingdom. That, for that, you, you, you have to work. Well, what was the final verdict on this little conversation? Verse 11. You don't accept our testimony. And by the way, the pronoun you is plural, so you and all the rest of the Pharisees and the nation. And then verse 12, I've been telling you earthly things. I gave you an analogy of birth. I gave you a second analogy of wind. You don't believe. What didn't he believe? He believed that Jesus was a teacher sent from God because nobody could do what he did apart from that. But he didn't believe that the way into the kingdom was something to which he could make no contribution. He just couldn't get extracted out of a works righteousness system. What what happened to Nicodemus? Turn to John 7. Things are heating up, as you you remember, for Jesus by the seventh chapter. The Jews, verse 1, are seeking to kill Him. Jesus goes into the temple. Everything He says just elevates their hatred, their animosity. They're infuriated with Him. We won't take time to go all the way through 
But if you come down to verse 40, some of the people, therefore, when they heard these words, uh, were saying, this certainly is the prophet. Others were saying, this is the Messiah or the Christ. Others were saying, surely the Christ or Messiah is not going to come from Galilee, is He? Has not the Scripture and uh, said that the Christ comes from the descendants of David and from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So a division occurred in the crowd because of Him. Some of them wanted to seize Him. No one laid hands on Him. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees and said to them, Why do you not bring Him? Arrest Him! Bring Him! They wanted Him dead. The officers said, Never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. The Pharisees then answered them, You have not also been led astray, have you? No one of the rulers or Pharisees has believed in Him. Oh, okay. So Nicodemus isn't a believer now. But verse 50, Nicodemus, he who came to Him before, being one of them, said to them, Our law does not judge a man until it first hears from him and knows what he's doing, does it? Wow, Nicodemus, good move. He stepped up and said, We can't, we can't judge this man without a trial. Nicodemus becomes a defender of Jesus. Something's going on. I mean, he could have resented Jesus with a deep, profound hatred, right? From what Jesus had said to him. But now he's. He steps in to protect Jesus from the ruler's murderous intention. And this is a long time later. Finally, look at John 19. Verse 38. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate granted permission, so he came and took away his body. Nicodemus, who had first come to him by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. So they took the body of Jesus, bound it in linen wrappings with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where He was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. Therefore because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Nicodemus brought about seventy-five pounds of spices. That would be fit for uh, a nobleman like himself. That's powdered rosin with aloes for fragrance, kind of giving a sandalwood smell since the Jews didn't embalm. Both men are bold now. Joseph of Arimathea had been a disciple, but in secret, no more, gone to Pilate and put himself on record in front of everybody. Somewhere between uh, John 3 and John 19, the wind blew. <laughs> and the rest of the story. Traditions tell us that Nicodemus showed up at the trial of Jesus before Pilate and gave a defense of Jesus to Pilate. Tradition says that uh, Nicodemus was baptized by two apostles, Peter and John, and that his confession of the Lord Jesus as Savior led him to be deprived of his office. He was removed from the Sanhedrin. He was permanently banished from Jerusalem by hostile Jews. He was reduced with his family to utter poverty so severe that there's a wonderful story about his daughter. His daughter was so destitute that she reached the level of 
shame, where she was found digging in the dung piles for pieces of grain to eat. And a rabbi came by and felt compassion on this lady, and he asked who she was. And she said, the daughter of Nicodemus, to which he asked, what happened to your father? She told him he had followed Jesus Christ and been banished. The story ends with this comment, the rabbi refused to help her. Foti, a centuries later, refers to an ancient document that records that Nicodemus was martyred for his devotion to Jesus Christ by being beaten to death by a mob. I don't know about those details, but, but you can get the real story when you get to heaven. So what can the sinner do? What can the sinner do? The rest of the chapter says, believe, believe. But the sinner can't believe without regeneration. What can a sinner do? When I preached through that for weeks, I just would close every sermon by saying, what do you tell the sinner? You can ask. You can ask. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You don't have a right. You haven't achieved anything which lays a claim on God to give you anything. But you can ask. You can ask. I stood by the bedside of a dying young man, ravaged by AIDS, 25 years in homosexuality. We had this kind of conversation. And he said, What do I do? What do I do? I said, You can ask. He said, Would you ask for me? I knelt down by his bed and I pled with God to give him life. That's what we can do. That's all we can do. But John 6.37 says, Him that comes to me, I will never turn away. Jesus Himself said, Ask and you shall 